Sometimes life is difficult and you just need a hand to lift you up. The Bible is full of those helping hands, but how do you access them? How do you apply them? Join our weekly conversation and think about the Bible like you never have before. Listen, watch, and interact with us at ChristianQuestions.com. You're listening to Christian Questions. Here's Rick and Jonathan. Dale Carnegie once said, if there's anyone's secret to success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and see things from that person's angle as well as from your own. I'm Rick, and this is not your typical Christian commentary as we look at Bible-related topics from a different perspective. I'm Jonathan. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. We thank you for joining us today. This is a contact-friendly format, and we do welcome your thoughts uh, by way of email, messaging us at ChristianQuestions.com, Facebook, and our website chat board. So, Jonathan, what's our topic for today? Well, Rick, our question is, do you communicate or just talk? Our theme text is found in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. All right, so the question, do you communicate or just talk? Without communication, human life would cease to exist. We need to express ourselves and we need to absorb the expressions of others. People's need to be heard and to share their thoughts, feelings, and lies with one another gave birth to the phenomena of social media. And here is where we need to pause and consider. Somewhere along the line, our ability to actually communicate has gone down a diminishing pathway, while our desire to be, to be seen and to weigh in has blossomed. This trend affects all generations, but seems to be especially powerful among those who have never known anything but the Internet. In our desire to seek consensus and belonging, we seem to have forgotten our need for honest, one-to-one communication. So how do we stop the trend? How do we rekindle the deep and life-sustaining value of sincere mutual understanding? Jonathan, these are big, big, hard, difficult questions. So, folks, coming up in this week's podcast, here's a question for you. When others engage in conversation with you, does it seem like that they're set up to listen or to just talk? Most likely, it's to talk. So what do you do with that? In segments two and three, we're actually going to take a close look at how to make listening the foundation for taking our turn to talk. How about this? In our world, our our, I'm sorry, our world seems to be driven by talking heads who take stands and seemingly ignore other points of view. Makes you wonder, is it even possible to have a balanced conversation anymore? In segments four and five, we're going to uncover what's behind the ability to actually have a real, balanced back and forth, actual conversation. But first, how has our understanding of what communication is changed since biblical times? You may be surprised by that answer. And Jonathan, we're going to be getting to that in just a moment. But uh, again, communicating is a big deal. It is. We all do it to some degree or other. The question is, how well do we do it? And what is the fruitage or damage of our communications. How true. So that's what we're going to want to find out. Let's go to a soundbite just to get things started. This is from Five Ways to Listen Better by Julian Treasure. This was a TED Talk. I said at the beginning we're losing our listening. Why did I say that? Well, there are a lot of reasons for this. First of all, we invented ways of recording. First, writing then audio recording and now video recording as well, the premium on accurate and careful listening has simply disappeared. Secondly, the world is now so noisy with this cacophony going on visually and auditorially, it's just hard to listen. It's tiring to listen. Many people take refuge in headphones, but they turn big public spaces like this, shared soundscapes, into millions of tiny little personal sound bubbles. In this scenario, nobody's listening to anybody. We're becoming impatient. We don't want oratory anymore, we want sound bites. And the art of conversation is being replaced dangerously, I think, by personal broadcasting. 
he said a lot of things in that uh, that 55 seconds that were pretty powerful. And, you know, and it was just a soundbite, you know, and that's what everybody wants. <laughs> but we're going to come back to him several times. Um, but, but you know, the, the idea that uh, there's so much noise, it's hard to really get through it all and to find the real true communication. The idea that so many people in public spaces are walking through those public spaces with headphones. You know what that's saying? That's announcing to everybody else. Whatever you're doing, whatever you're thinking, whatever is happening around me is irrelevant because I am doing something else. I am ignoring everyone <laughs> yeah, else. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, it, yeah. It comes back to selfishness, doesn't it? it yeah, in, in a lot of ways. And you think, well, okay, but you know, maybe people need to focus or maybe they're on the phone. Maybe they are, but most of the time they're not. Most of the time it's listening to music or something, you know, to, to, to sort of distract your own mind. The point is we need to be able to communicate one with another. How do we do that? Now, the Bible doesn't talk about communicating in the way that we often refer to it from the standpoint of understanding feelings. Because, you know, for us, you know, when, you know, did you really communicate with them? Did you bond? You know, that's kind of what we sense in terms of what communication really is. The Bible does, however, give a number of examples of communicating through co-laboring and through common cause. Here is biblical communication. There's a few words that are mainly used, Jonathan. Let's go through these uh, relatively quickly. Uh, fir first word, definition, then give us a, a couple of scriptural examples. Well, Rick, it means to share with others, Galatians 6.6. 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Okay, so communicate is to share with others. So to be helpful to the one who is teaching you, you should communicate, be helpful to them. And the second scripture, 1 Timothy 5.22, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins. Keep yourself pure. And Rick, that word partaker is that word to share with others. Okay, so neither be sharing in other man's sins. So and that so that makes perfect sense of that's a communication you don't want to be part of. Another word for communication, very, very similar but slightly different. It means partnership. And let's read Hebrews thirteen, verse sixteen. But to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. Okay, so to do good and to partner. Forget not. And, and you know, that's a, that's a, that's a nice, that's a, that's a powerful sense. As a Christian, to do good and to partner with others. The, the apostle saying, don't forget to be partners in the gospel. And I, I think that's a great communication example there. And then the third word is very similar. What is that? Communicative. And the scripture, 1 Timothy 6.18 reads, Then they do good that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate. Okay, willing to, so being, so they're, they're communicative. And, and, you know, Jonathan, a lot of this has to do with supporting one another in, especially in those times, there was a lot of financial support passed back and forth, freely given financial support of other individuals who were not as fortunate as some were. And Rick, all these words are very directed. They're, they're not emotional. No, no, that's the interesting thing. They're not, they're, you don't see anything about bonding. No. You, you know, and, and, and our souls connecting when we're talking here. This is very clear. This is, these, carry, these words carry the sense of participation in somebody else's life and not merely contributing input into that life. So, you know, they seem to imply an understanding, a sense of, kind of um, being on the same page. That makes sense, yeah. So biblical communication, I think, is really much, very much about where we are going as a body. And it's the sort of linking arms and wanting to go in that direction together. And that's what a lot of biblical communication seems to be uh, what, we're, what we're focusing on here. So very different than typical communication in, in today's world. So what page then, are we supposed to be on for our communication from a biblical sense to be in high gear? I think if we look at Hebrews 10, 21 to 25, that will give us a, um, a sense of that. And we're going to break this up into a lot of pieces. In other words, I'm going to interrupt you all over the place. <laughs> Sounds familiar. <laughs> 
And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Okay, so let, let's pause there. We're trying to figure out what's the common ground of our Christian communication. Because, it's Jesus. And that's the simple answer. See, now here I am going to go to this long, drawn-out <laughs> explanation, and you have the audacity <laughs> to answer it with one word. Well, I'm still going to give my long, drawn-out explanation. Okay. <laughs> but you're right. And, and, and it breaks the, the, the centrality of Jesus in our lives up into pieces. It says, let's draw near with a sincere heart, with full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean, um, and our bodies washed with pure water. So what this first part of Hebrews 10, 21 to 25 is talking about is what do I look like in this whole, in this whole scenario? Am I walking in, in assurance of faith? And is my heart cleaned? And am I washed with the word? So it's, it's, it's really about how have I prepared myself to be a, quote, communicator? And again, communication is not necessarily the bonding of two souls so much as it is the contributing and locking arms with you as we walk the Christian walk. So am I in the right place to do that? Go ahead, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The phrase in verse 23 that really jumps out at me is the phrase, without wavering. You know, it's one thing to say, yes, I am a person of faith. But are we holding the confession of our hope without wavering? And, that, and, and why do we not have a need to waver? Because God is faithful. Period. So we just need to stand up and do our part. So this is about our preparation. Go ahead. And that made me think of what the body of Christ is all about. Sometimes one day I may be weak, but you could be strong. And your strength re rejuvenates me to keep focused right. and vice versa. Right. And, and that's what uh, the, the Christian sacrificial steps are to, to be together, right. to work together. Right. So, so the communication is for the purpose of building one another up. Verse 24. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now, Rick, this verse is what we started with, isn't it? This was the first verse of Christian Questions, period. At the very beginning of the very first uh, radio broadcast 20 and a half years ago, uh, we said, you know, uh, one of our goals is to, is, to, is to provoke one another. That's what it says in the King James Version. Provoke one another to love and good works. You know, and our, our very first podcast, I think, was on provoking one another to love and good works. I think you're right. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and that's the thing. This is a simple verse. Consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, love and good works. The point is, that's what we're supposed to be communicating for. That's the purpose. It's not to check out the weather. It's to provoke someone else upward, onward, in a good, powerful, strong sense. And then finally, verse 25. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So communication again comes out in verse 25, doesn't say the word, but it says don't forsake our assembling together. And it says, as is the habit of some. So it, really, Jonathan, it's talking about you are valuable to me even if I'm not in the mood for you to be valuable to me. <laughs> we need each other to build each other up. But here it says, be encouraging to one another. Yes. We, human nature, we're not all strong every moment of every day. Right. We need each other. Right. And, and that's why the, a body is such a great example of the body of Christ, because the body has this ability to work together. And when something's hurt, the rest of the body rallies around that point of pain. So, so our Christian life is entirely built around the faithfulness of Jesus and our invitation to follow him. As we communicate, we must always keep in mind that we are connected to each other, and just like you said at the beginning, it's through Jesus. 
Jonathan, during this podcast, we're going to touch on several New Testament, quote, one another, unquote, commands. These are really cool. And in CQ Rewind, the, uh, the bonus material, uh, we got a whole list of these things that one of our contributors sent along to us. These serve as powerful communication guidelines. So here is probably the, the ultimate, quote, one another command found in John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. See, whenever you have a one another command, that is really a command of communication. It's saying, here's how you treat one another, and in this case, how you unselfishly love one another. You know, Jonathan, the idea of me saying to to you, maybe I haven't spoken to you in, in several years. Now, obviously, this isn't true, so, <laughs> but in several years, because you and I disagree on something. And I say to you, you know, in passing, you know, several years later, well, you know, I've loved you, you know, the, the way Jesus loves us all that time. What? And, he didn't even talk to me. <laughs> well, you know, and, and you, you kind of lose some of the, the, the depth of what that would really mean. Yeah. Let us love one another as I have loved you. What did Jesus do? He showed them the way. He showed them that he would lay down his life for them. And he said, now follow me. So it is being engaged in the lives of the brotherhood. That's Christian communication. So we're going to have at the end of each segment our uh, connecting our communication because there's lots of pieces to connect. What is the first point of connecting our communication? Our best communication is moving others towards love and good deeds. That's the best motivation for communication, period, to move others toward love and good deeds. You can't get better communication than that. So Christian, Christian communication is most importantly for the purpose of lifting others up. That changes everything. Now that we know something about what communication is, what do we do to communicate successfully? We have a simple yet powerful request for you. Can you think of someone who'd enjoy listening to this podcast? Send them a text message right now. Tell them to check out our Christian Questions podcast. That's one of the great ways to spread the word. Thank you for sharing our weekly conversation with every single person you know. Well, who you want to tell is still up to you. Thanks for texting and listening. Let's go back to Rick and Jonathan as we take a closer look at our topic. To be able to connect with others is an art. Most of us do not naturally have an understanding of how this actually works. So we're going to break it down into four basic areas of learning. Our first stop on this journey has to do with the side of communication that we probably don't think about too often. And what is that? It's all about listening. That's what it's all about, listening. And just to begin to illustrate this, Jonathan, we've got, I, I, I can see you smiling already. I love this. Th- this, this next story, we're going to play it over a few segments. It's, it's a story about some kids. Uh, it's being used as an illustration in a talk given by Karen Buxman, uh, on the importance of communicating clearly. So she's using this in a, in a talk to, to, I think, a corporate audience. So let's just listen as she lays the groundwork and begins the story. One of the things that we have to deal with is communication. And sometimes we think we're doing a good job of communicating, but really people are not hearing what we're saying. I remembered this incident that happened back when I was in pre-K. And it was the end of the day and all of us were to get on our coats and our boots and our mittens. We were sitting on our little red benches when I looked over and my best friend, Jill, who's got eyes as big as saucers, she was just sitting there just sitting there. Mrs. Seeley looked over and saw her sitting there and she goes, Jill, Jill, get your boots on. And Jill simply looked at her and said, I can't get these boots on. So Mrs. Seeley goes over, drops to her knees, and she starts shoving and shoving and shoving, working up a sweat. And she finally gets one boot on and then the other, she shoves and shoves and shoves and she finally gets that boot on. She's like, Jill, these boots, they barely fit you. Jill looks at her and said, they're not my boots. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, you got to love it. And much more to come on that story. And remember, again, this is a story that is helping us to understand the necessity of communicating clearly. Okay, so we'll we'll see how that unfolds as we go. But, you know, they're not my boots. Just just the kind of thing a four-year-old would say. Exactly. Uh, okay, so as we get started now in this, in this four-stop journey to kind of put communication in order, one of the first things we need to really focus on is to communicate with sincerity. And to do that, we want to magnify, magnify your listening capacity. And Rick, to me, this segment really means listen to understand. Okay. Magnify your listening capacity. Listen to understand. Stephen Covey, a lot of people have heard of him. He's a tremendous, tremendous author. In 1989, he wrote a book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Now, I've read the book several times. Wonderful book. And it, it gave, that book gave massive insights into communicating. Habit number five in those seven habits of highly effective people says, seek to understand then to be understood. And Jonathan, that fits exactly in with what you just said. Listening is for the purpose of understanding and not for the purpose of warming up so you can say what you're going to say. Good point, which we often want to do. Right? Yeah, and we're going to go through that several times in, in this particular segment. So when we look at Hebrews chapter 4, 16, we're kind of dropping in on the middle of a thought. So I'm just going to start verse before verse 16, and I'm going to say these next words are, because of Jesus, and then Jonathan verse 16. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So when you go to the throne of grace, what is that saying? What are you doing when you go to this throne of grace? Well, Rick, that makes me think about how God is such a gracious listener to everything that we want to pour out to him. He is. He is. a. That's what that says. Go to the throne of of it's not the throne of justice or the throne of wisdom or love or power in this instance. It's the throne of grace because God will graciously listen. So that's the standard, okay? When you said, you know, the, the idea of, of listening is to understand, God gives us his gracious listening. James 1, verses 19 to 23. Let's do 19 and 20 to get started. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Okay. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. We often look at these words and we think, wow, James is really telling us we've got to be good listeners. And he is. He is telling us we've got to be good listeners. But what's what? Quick quiz, quiz for you, Jonathan. What's my favorite thing in discussing the Bible? The context, Rick. That's right. So let's go a little further and establish the context of this particular listening that James talks about in verses 19 and 20. It's deeper than just being a good listener. Let's go to verse 21. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness in humility, receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. So it says, put everything aside. And what is it that we're supposed to receive? The word implanted. Whose word? Mine? God's word. Not mine. No. No. <laughs> you can say it. It's good. God's word. <laughs> that's right. You know what? See, and that's the important thing here. This is about listening to God's word first. And if we can get it into our heads that to be a gracious listener... The pathway to gracious listening is through the Word of God, is through listening to it so that we can learn how to listen through it. And, you know, we just have to get that into our minds. It's about God's Word. If we listen to it first, listening to others becomes so much easier because the Word of God, if we allow it to, changes the way we think. It alters our state of mind and gives us the ability to hear much more readily and much more easily. Verse 22 from James chapter 1. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. 
So here's the thing. It doesn't end with just hearing. It's good to hear the word of God. But James brings it a little further. He says, now we have to be doers. And being a doer of the word of God, so, so, so we position ourselves to listen to it. And then James says, you not only listen, but you have to do it. Now you're really in a position to be a better listener because you let the word of God absorb into your heart and begin to change your character. So, Jonathan, let's get a little practical here for a few minutes here. We certainly don't, can't listen like God can. Okay, I mean, right, we're imperfect. Right. Yep. Great to try, but we can't. So how much of somebody's story or issue then should we listen to? We're not God. So what would you say? How much of someone's story should we listen to? Well, from my perspective, we should listen to all of it since it's important to them. Uh, I guess uh, that leads me to the question, do I want others to care enough about my story or issues? Uh, it's give and take uh, here, uh, especially in Christ. So by being willing to listen to the whole story, what we're doing is we're telling that individual, you're important to me. That's exactly true. Okay. Now, let, let's develop that a little bit further. Because along with listening, what happens if, as we listen to the story, and you know, typically, stories that we share have other people involved, other players in that story. And there's typically some who do well by us and some who don't do well by us and some who make us happy and some who make us ragingly angry and so forth and so on. So in the process of listening, one of the things we want to be careful about is to not listen to gossip. So how do you listen to somebody's story without listening to gossip. That, that's hard. That, it, that's a challenge. It right? is. And, and I think from, from, from experience, one of the things that, that I have, and not to say that I'm really great at this, okay, but it's one of the things I have personally tried is to reframe parts of the story. When someone says, you know, Jonathan, you're telling me a, a, a trauma in your life, and you say to me that, well, so-and-so did this to me, and man, they, they, they were out to get me. And they were just there, and they, it was pre-planned, and they were out to get me. I would stop and say, okay, well, Jonathan, I, know, I understand that that's how you feel. But really, are you and I able to read anybody else's heart? I mean, we can't even read our own that well, right? Right, you got it. So no, the answer is no, we can't read the heart. So let's just say that what they did came across to you as being out to get you. Because I don't know what their heart was. And really, honestly, you don't either. Jesus was the only human being who could read somebody's heart. So it's important to listen to the whole story and also important to not listen to things that are not appropriate and to be able to reframe those things so that we can hear the story. And by doing that, especially with gentleness and kindness and grace, it helps the teller of the story begin to realize that I'm really mad. I can see that I'm really mad here. Maybe I should calm down and take a breath. Because me, yeah, you know what? I don't, I don't know. I don't know their heart. I don't. So it's great to want to listen, but we need to be careful that we don't listen to gossip in the process. And how, how often in, in a disagreement do we misunderstand each other and yeah. simple clarity can fix it? <laughs> right, right, right. And, and we're going we're gonna to develop that further as we go, but that's such an important thing. Clarity can fix it, but, you know, if we're not honest with one another, we never get to clarity. Good so, point. So communication, again, we're focusing on listening at this point. Let's go back to Julian Treasure and his TED Talk, Five Ways to Listen Better. Just very, very short clip about what we've been talking about. We've been talking about listening intention, with intention. He, he names it something slightly different. This is a serious problem that we're losing our listening. This is not trivial because listening is our access to understanding. Conscious listening always creates understanding. And only without conscious listening can these things happen. A world where we don't listen to each other at all is a very scary place indeed. Conscious listening. That's what he's talking about here. And we need to take that with us as we go through this podcast, the concept of conscious listening. You know, my son-in-law, Don, is a tremendous conscious listener. He has this sense about wanting to get to the bottom of things, and so he will find sources and he will listen intently to try to figure out 
what those sources are revealing. And he's not afraid to go to different types of sources on different sides of an issue to consciously listen. That is a rarity. But I, one, that's one of the that's things. Powerful, that's powerful, right? I, I have powerful. such great respect for his listening and his desire to just get the truth and not be afraid to talk to someone who may be in disagreement. Of course, that doesn't usually go so well because most people can't handle that, but he keeps on trying. I just give him credit. Let's go back to another one of the one another commands in Scripture, Galatians five thirteen to 15. For you were called to freedom, brethren, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. So the key phrase in that verse is through love, serve one another. Serve one another. See, that's, how, that's a communication technique, to serve. How do you know how to serve someone unless you listen to what the needs are that need to be served? You're right. So great. It's great to want to serve one another. Then listen. Consciously listen to find ways that service will be valuable. What better way to serve someone than to listen, than to really listen? Great quote from Sue Patton. Deep listening is miraculous for both listener and speaker. When someone receives us with open-hearted, non-judging, intensely interested listening, our spirits expand. And that is so, so true. When you feel like you're being heard, everything can begin to move in the right direction. It breaks down barriers. It, it opens up uh, possibilities because now you've been heard and hopefully the door to understanding is now open. Proverbs 18.13, a great, great scripture. He who gives an answer before he hears, it is a folly and shame to him. Before you consciously listen, if you start giving your answer before the other person's finished their statement, the scripture says that's folly and shame. Uh, I, I, I've got to be careful because <laughs> I've seen myself do that. <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> no, you're right. It's not. And, and we all fall into that trap. So, Jonathan, we have some very simple listening tools here that we just want to list out very, very quickly. First, what's the first one? Put aside distractions and focus on the person speaking, even if it's on the phone. You know, and I do a lot of communicating on the phone. And oftentimes I'm sitting in my office, I'm working, and somebody calls me with whether it be a professional issue or another type of issue, and I start to listen. But my computer screen is still open in front of me. Whatever I was doing is still sitting right there. And let me tell you how tempting it is to just pay attention and maybe click one or two things. Sometimes, <laughs> look, sometimes I do that. And then I say, what are you doing? And sometimes I'll literally I'll just close the computer. Sometimes I'll close my eyes and I'll plug my other ear because it's like, stop, focus, will you please? So put aside distractions. What's next? Position yourself to listen and take notes if appropriate. Sometimes changing your bodily position into a listening stature makes such a difference. If you're sitting at a table with somebody, lean forward, put your elbows on the table, and look at them. That's listening. What's the third one? Repeat what they said back to them. For instance, say, what, what you're saying is, or wait, let me see if I've got this, or help me understand. What I hear you saying is... So, in other words, by repeating back what they've said in different words, you are telling them unequivocally, I heard what you said, here's what I think what you said, is, is what you said. And sometimes they'll say, no, no, that's not what I was saying. And then you say, I'm sorry, I missed it. Can you, let, let's do that again. And just let them go through it again. And I am telling you, especially with teenagers, this works. This, these little uh, techniques of listening really, really work. Well, Rick, it shows respect yeah, for yeah. the person speaking. Absolutely. And how often do people get that respect? Right. And when they are the only thing that matters in the world because they're the person right in front of you, you're right. That's great, great respect. Proverbs 17, 27 and 28. He who restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Even a fool, when he keeps silent, is considered wise. When he closes his lips, he is considered 
prudent. <laughs> you know, and again, the wisdom of being quiet and listening. Listen to God's word first, God's input first, but listen to the words, to the body language, to the tonality of whomever it is that you are speaking to, and, and you can see the whole tone change when you lock in to just listening. So connecting our communication based on this, this uh, segment of listening is what? Well, Rick, to listen with intense interest is the foundation of being heard. If you want to be heard, then listen the way you would like to be heard. And you said that earlier in slightly different words, but that's the key. Listen with intense interest. Consciously listen. Be intentional. And that's the foundation for you to be heard as well as the other person. It is far too easy to view listening as a prelude to what I'm going to say. Time to rethink that. Listening is a foundational, but any good conversation is a two-way street. What should we be saying? Before we turn the page, we wanted to tell you about CQ Rewind. It's a free weekly service provided by our great team of contributors who help the guys prepare for each episode. It's an in-depth look at their research, scripture, and much more, showing you the map of Rick and Jonathan's content journey. Now let's continue finding out the better answers as we ask the better questions. One of the key factors to that two-way street is being truly, prof- be- being truly profitable for everyone is to not be thinking about what you're going to say while you pretend to listen. It's so easy to want to jump ahead to my turn. The danger here is missing something key in the other person's story or reasoning. And Jonathan, we just, if you want to really communicate, you just can't take that chance. You have to be that really gracious, interested, conscious listener. And it, it is a lack of respect if you don't. Yeah, you know, and I keep, I'm glad you keep bringing that up. And, and don't stop because that's so fundamentally life-changing to, 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 to get into our heads that I am respectful when I consciously listen. I am disrespectful when I don't. Powerful thought. Let's get back to the story about the boots. And poor Jill has her brother's boots. Okay, now what? Mrs. Seeley's face became pale. She dropped to her knees and she starts pulling and pulling and pulling. And she gets a boot off, pulls and pulls, finally gets the other boot off, holds the boots up to the class. She goes, all right, all right, whose boots are these? Jill looks up at her and says, they're my brothers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, they weren't her boots. I gave away the punchline before the story started, but hey, oh well. You know what? I wasn't listening. <laughs> I wasn't following the cue on my paper. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's such a funny thing because a little kid says, look, I can't get these boots on. And the teacher just assumes that, you know, okay, and the, the, they must not be your boots. So, you know, they're not my boots. Okay, well, whose are they? You know, the, the, you didn't finish the communication, and so now you have another deal part of the story that you've just wasted time, <laughs> essentially, because, well, they're actually her brother's boots. Well, what's going to happen with that? We'll find out in the next segment, but I love the story. Um, so let's get back to communicating with clarity. Uh, we, you know, we started off in the first segment saying magnify your, your, or the last segment rather, magnify your listening capacity. And now we're moving on to monitor what comes out of your mouth. And Rick, to me, this segment comes down to thoughtful speech. Simple. Thoughtful speech. Be very, very considerate of the words you're going to be using. In Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, habit number two uh, is what? what? What's that second habit? Begin with the end in mind. See, there's no better way to monitor our words than to ask ourselves what the reason is for speaking those words. Is the reason to provoke somebody? Is the reason to be sarcastic? Is the reason so I can be judgmental? Is the reason so I can contribute? What is the reason? What is the reason? Begin with the end in mind. What's the end result of the words that I'm about to speak? And Jonathan, we know 
what our heart is telling us on these things. You You're know, right, Rick. when we're going to react to somebody, we yeah. know, we know, maybe we don't want to admit it, but we know. Hey, Rick, um, the story of the boots reminded me uh, of something one of our CQ volunteers said to us this week. Melinda said to her son, Lucas, bring me the towels from your bathroom so I can wash them. Lucas comes down with an armful of folded clean towels <laughs> and dumps them in the to be washed pile. She said, well, what an example of non-effective communication. I will definitely listen on Monday's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, from her standpoint, she knew exactly what she meant. She did. And if, if I were listening to that, I would have known what she meant. But Lucas took it totally, literally, and in good faith, fulfilled his mother's request <laughs> with vim vigor vitality and brought all the towels down to he be washed did. <laughs> you know and you applaud him for listening so well and then yes. mom like okay next time be a little bit more specific <laughs> but it's such a great story you know and we can learn so much by miscues with children oh yes because it teaches us to be clear to be to be focused on things ephesians 4 25 to 32 we'll break this up in a few pieces therefore laying aside falsehood Speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, and yet do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil an opportunity. Okay, so lay aside falsehood. True, truth should be coming out of our mouths. And, you know, that's a fundamental for communication. We must be speaking truthfully. Now, just want to mention here, and we'll come back to it, all truth is not to be spoken at all times. Good point. You know, and we're going to get to that later on in the, in the, uh, in the uh, segment here. But anger, the, 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 the apostle's not saying don't ever, ever allow yourself to get angry. He's saying anger is acceptable, but it has to be bridled. It has to be controlled. And he says, don't, you know, be angry, and yet do not sin. It's okay but don't react in a way that causes you to, to act sinfully. So truth should come from our mouths. Anger is okay, but it's not okay if it causes us or if we decide to act sinfully because of it. Verse 28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Now, so that he will have something to share. That's in line with biblical communication. It is. The whole point of biblical Christian communication is to help the others who are walking the same walk as you out. Help them move forward. You know, so he says, you know, you, each of us must labor performing with our own hands so we can be prepared to communicate goodness and charity and grace uh, and love to others by what we, what we do. So really, this is saying transform from being a taker to being a giver. Nice. And this is a transformation in, in what our life communicates. And, and Jonathan, look, we all have areas in our lives that we tend toward taking rather than toward giving. You're right. And so we need to focus on those and say, okay, I need to work on that so that my communication in this area of my life is 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 not just righteous but it's godly and again communication is not just words either it's actions very very much actions uh getting back to words though verse 29 and 30 of ephesians 4 let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear do not grieve the holy spirit of god by whom you were sealed by the day of redemption. So, no unwholesome words. Then it says, only words such as are good for edification. And you can stop the sentence there. But then it clarifies it even further. What's it say after that? I love this, Rick. According to the need of the moment. Okay, not according to my need in the moment, but according to the need of what's happening around me. Those are the words that I should speak, not to satisfy my own ego or my own mood or my own anger or whatever it is. But it's to be in the present, isn't it? Yes, right. 
and it's being outside of yourself in the present. So your communication is actually constructive. Even if you have to speak uh, correctively to someone, that should be a constructive process, not a tearing down and beating up, but it should be a constructive process. Be in the present, like you said. Speak the words of one who truly and deeply cares about others. So, you know, you were talking about several times listening is a sign, really true listening is a sign of great respect. Mm -hmm. Speaking in an edification way toward the need of the moment is another sign of real true respect. When we go outside that guideline, our respect begins to diminish. And that's kind of a sad thing. But that's why verse 31 and 32 are here to help us understand that. Go ahead with those. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. See, another one of the one another commandments. Be kind to one another. You know, let the bitterness and the anger and all of that, just let those things slide away. You have something more powerful here. Communicate kindness one to another. Our communication should reflect the life of one who has been forgiven themselves and remembers the fact that I have been forgiven. And, and Rick, that looks like true humility, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. When and, you can do that. You know, and, and that is going to come up again in the next segment, the depth and the power of real, true, true, true humility. But communication needs all of these things. And we're focusing on our words and our communications outward. Is In the last segment, we're focusing on what comes into us. So, Jonathan, again, let's get practical here for a minute. While all of this sounds good, what should I do when I just don't feel I can get to such a spiritually high level when I need to communicate? I mean, you know, I'm just not up to it. What, what do I do? Well, how about righteous communication, which is not necessarily spiritual? Uh, you can be kind, loving, caring, helpful, and encouraging, and hopefully God-honoring. But if the situation is not a, a spiritual conversation, but just greeting someone or helping a neighbor, try to do good. So, and, and even if we're not, we're in a, in a place where we can't key in on, on the spirituality what you're saying is key on, on, on the basic uh, instinct of righteousness. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's such a great, great piece of advice because it, it helps to say, okay, maybe I can't do it you know, as well as I should, but I can at least do this. Yes. And this is still trying to build up another and trying to encourage the other and try to edify that other individual and, and to, again, lock arms with them and walk along with them. And that reminds me of Romans twelve seventeen. Res respect what is right in the sight of all men. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, positively. So righteousness, at least, should always be coming from us as Christians. Great quote from Washington Irving. The tongue is the only tool that gets sharper with use. And that, my friends, is a warning, <laughs> if I ever <laughs> saw one. Proverbs 25, 11 and 12. Like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Like an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold is a wise reprover to a listening ear. So the proverb scripture goes right along with the Ephesian scripture. Remember the words, the Ephesian scripture said words of edification according to the need of the moment. Yes, it really does fit. And here in Proverbs, it's a, a word spoken in right circumstances. That means think before you speak. Don't feel before you speak. Think before you speak to see if the circumstances and the words match in a godly, godly way. Let, let's go back to Julian Treasure with his TED Talk, Five Ways to Listen Better. He's going to go start to just very briefly go through the five ways. And these are really fascinating to just take with us and try to apply wherever we can. Good. The first one is silence. Just three minutes a day of silence is a wonderful exercise to reset your ears and to recalibrate so that you can hear the quiet again. If you can't get absolute silence, go for quiet. That's absolutely fine. Second, I call this the mixer. So it, even if you're in a noisy environment like this, and we all spend a lot of time in places like this, 
Listen in the coffee bar to how many channels of sound can I hear? How many individual channels in that mix am I listening to? You can do it in a beautiful place as well, like a, a lake. How many birds am I hearing? Where are they? Where are those ripples? It's a great exercise for improving the quality of your listening. So, Jonathan, having silence is a good thing to home sure. listening. But also, when there is a lot of chaotic noise, straining through it and picking out different strains of noise that, that, are, that are happening is a really good exercise. And, I, you know, I've done this. I'm fascinated with, with sound, and, and I've actually done that, and it really does help to, le- to help you learn to focus on things. So silence, find silence, three minutes a day, quiet, just silence, and then the mixer. Strain through the things that, that, that are being put before you. Proverbs twenty nine twenty. Do you see a man who is hasty in his words? There is more hope for a fool than for him. All right. Don't be hasty with what you say. Think first. If our words feel like they want to burst out of our mouths, that can be a sign of an unbridled tongue. That's enormous. If you can't... That, that is huge, Rick. I mean... That's something we all need to work on. I look at myself in the mirror and say, yes, focus on this, because this is important. So if you can't contain what you need to say, you've got to ask yourself if you are fitting into the next scripture, James 3, 8 to 10. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. So the tongue, if we are just dying to get our opinion out there, maybe we better think about why we're dying to get our opinion out there. We need to just be quiet and just relax, right? When we get that anxious feeling, we need to have a trigger in our head to say, whoa, stop. Yeah. Yeah, because we lose our ability to be thoughtful when we are so reactive. And reactive words generally don't build others up. <laughs> they generally destroy the environment that they're in. One more scripture for this segment, First Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. Did I detect another one another commandment there? You certainly did, brother. And what was it? Build up one another. So now think about these simple statements. And again, folks, seek to rewind the, 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 uh, the uh, bonus material. At the end, we've got a list of, I don't know, 20 or 25 of these. That's not all of them, but it really wakes you up to what our communication should look like. And so far, we, we've talked about ser- love one another, serve one another, be kind to one another, build up one another. These are all ways of communicating. What are we waiting for? I mean, when you think about this, this is exciting to me to see all of this unfold and say, look look at all the ways you can communicate. And what should our communication be for? The building up of others to, to, to help them along the way of Christianity. So it really does make a whole lot of difference here. So our words can be weapons just as easily as they can be agents of help and healing. We must be careful. Listening is the foundation, and our words are the building. The question is, whose design is it? As we keep this podcast conversation going, this very brief break allows us to tell you more about one of your hosts, Rick. Aside from being a student of the Bible for nearly 50 years, did you know he only drinks decaf coffee? Can you imagine if that detailed, passionate about extensive research in the Bible mind added caffeine to the equation? Jonathan would probably never get a word in. So thank you, Rick, for staying away from caffeine. As a listener, you never have to worry about making your voice heard. We love to answer your questions and respond to your comments at ChristianQuestions.com and all our social media channels. Let's throw it back to Rick and Jonathan. You know, um, <laughs> as important as their words are, I just love that caffeine thing, the source from which they are formed is vital. There are two primary places that words are born. The first place that we will examine is our hearts. This source can be just as wonderful as it can be devious. Heart-based communication will impact others for better or for worse. 
And, and Jonathan, in my hasty communication at the end of the last segment, I actually left out our connecting our communication point. So, and that is, Rick, weigh your words carefully, for they can carry an age-lasting impact. You know, our words can literally have an effect on someone else for the rest of their lives. Just think about that for a moment. Think about the power of our words. And that's going to bring us to our next segment here, which is really we're going to talk about heart-based communication, the positives and the very deep negatives of heart-based communication. But first, but first, the importance of communicating clearly and the story of little Jill and her brother's boots. Now, remember, you know, she couldn't get the boots on and the teacher forced them on. And, you know, she said, well, these aren't my boots. And she takes them off. She holds them up to the class and says, whose boots are these? And Jill says, they're my brothers. And so she puts them back on. <laughs> okay. So now where do we go in that story uh, from here? Let's listen. Now I thought Mrs. Seeley was going to cry. <laughs> she drops back down to her knees. Shoves, 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 shoves. When she finally stands up, she's like, Jill, where's your mittens? In the boots. <laughs> As a leader, you gotta be listening instead of, and communicating clearly. Communicating clearly. You know, <laughs> that's so funny. You know, but sometimes, Jonathan, listening is asking the next question. Mm. And listening because that provokes more communication. And if the teacher had taken a moment to ask the next question before she responded, she may not have had to take boots off so many times on and off, on and off, on and off. For and, sure. and, you know, so part of our listening needs to be to be engaged enough, respectful enough to ask the next question, which can help us to understand a little bit better. And, and that brings us to the point about dealing with our hearts. Communicate with purity. Manage the contents of your heart. And Rick, to me, this segment really comes down to spiritual input. What would Jesus say? What would Jesus say? So when we think about managing the contents of our heart, we ought to go back to what Jesus would say. Because when Jesus did speak from his heart. Oh, absolutely. And the difference between his and mine is his was pure, mine is not. It's that simple. So I have to manage what Jesus could instinctively use with wisdom and grace. Communicate with purity. So we, we've talked about magnifying our listening capacity. We've talked about monitoring what comes out of our mouth. And now for this segment, it's manage the contents of your heart. What would Jesus say? Stephen Covey in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, habit number three is what? Put first things first. To manage your heart, just like you said, see it through Jesus' own eyes. So let's look at Mark 7, 20 to 23. And, and, and Jonathan, the point of these scriptures is going to be one of, I think, the two most, most, most major points of this entire podcast. So carefully, let's listen to this scripture, Mark 7, 20 to 23. And he was saying, that which proceeds out of the man... That is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thieves, murders, adulterers, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Okay, now that, you know, I said, listen carefully, and that's like, oh, that's a crappy list, list to listen to. But you know what? You've got to listen to that, because the point that Jesus makes is really clear. It's very simple. And the point is, we, and let, let me rephrase this, I am solely responsible for the communications that proceed out of me. As much as I'd like to blame you, Jonathan, because maybe you set me off, I am am solely responsible for how I communicate. So you're saying you own your words. I own my words. I own my what I write. I own my emails. I own my texts. I own what I write on Instagram. 
I own it because I created it. Yes, even if you provoked me, Jesus is saying, do not go blame someone else. You are responsible. That's right. Me. I am. And folks, that to me. So the, the, the first major, major, major point was to listen intentionally. And the way you were putting it, Jonathan, remember when we were talking about listening intentionally? You were saying, mm-hmm. listen. Um, how to to understand. Right. And, 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 and by listening to understand, you listen respectfully. Yes. When we don't listen to understand, we are not being respectful. Here, we need to be understanding clearly that I own my communications. And you know, you know how easy it is to, to send out a tweet, and you see it all over the news every single day. People are tweeting this, and then somebody responds with that. Ha, I'll get them. And then it goes out, and thousands of people see it, and it goes viral. And, and then you say, well, you know, oh, I guess I shouldn't have said that. Hey, you owned it. You owned the moment, and that was your choice. Well, he made me. No, he didn't. He may have contributed, but you ultimately decided. See, because that was your heart. And Jonathan, that's scary. That is. That's scary. So we got to be careful of that. Let's go back to the five ways to listen better by Julian Treasure, his TED Talk. This is way number three and number four. Third, this exercise I call savoring. And this is a beautiful exercise. It's about enjoying mundane sounds. This, for example, is my tumble dryer. It's a waltz. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. I love it. So mundane sounds can be really interesting if you pay attention. I call that the hidden choir. It's around us all the time. The next exercise is probably the most important of all of these. If you just take one thing away, this is listening positions. The idea that you can move your listening position to what's appropriate to what you're listening to. You know, and we touched on that earlier in the, in the podcast, the idea of setting yourself up to hear. Uh, but, you know, the idea of savoring. Whatever the noise is, find the rhythm, find something in it. And, and he brings up a really good point, because if we sort of can embrace the noise that we can't control, it makes it easier to deal with the noise that we can't control. Instead of saying to ourselves, I can't stand that noise, I can't stand that noise, I can't stand that noise, embrace it, find a way. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's a good good point. Go ahead. The listening filters, it made me think, Rick, of when someone is asked to offer a prayer in a Bible study. You put yourself in a position to clearly listen to the words because there may be a message or something that the Lord is going to answer a prayer from who knows when that could be coming to you. But if if you're thinking about your own thoughts while this prayer is going on, you're missing the value of it. That's such a powerful point. That is so, so, that, that's profound because it's just, and when we were talking about it before, be in the moment. Yes. So put reins on your heart so that you can rest enough to absorb what's, what's being said literally mm-hmm. before you and before God. And boy, yes. talk about a time to be respectful. That's Amen. the time. Amen, brother. Yes. <laughs> you know, and so let's talk about respect because, you know, there's a difference between commanding respect and commanding attention. Let's start with commanding attention. Celebrities, sports figures, politicians, they do this all the time. People's egos and imaginations follow them. You know, a lot of times people say, well, he captured their hearts. And I would say generally no. You captured their imagination. You capture the fantasy of their own ego. But to capture someone's heart is an entirely different thing. So when you command attention, you're just getting people to look at you. Great scriptural example, Acts 8 9 through 13. Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. Okay, just pause there for a second. They were all giving attention. He was commanding attention because he was doing things that were really, really sensational looking. Now continue. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, 
He was constantly amazed. So notice the difference. They're all paying attention to Simon, the great man of God, you know, what, kind of what he named himself, and then believing what Philip said and being baptized. There's a whole, there's a completely different sense to those two things. Commanding respect. Now, let's talk about, because that's what Philip was doing, and we'll see that's what the apostles do next in this, in this account. Commanding respect. Leaders true heroes, those who have accomplished truly magnificent things, and those who set an example for us are instinctively perceived to be in the category of commanding respect. People's hearts follow them. When I say people who, who have accomplished something truly magnificent, I'm not talking about somebody who sets a, a, a record on, on, on a field of play. I'm talking about life-changing, profound things that take lifelong dedication and, and, and something different than an actor or an athlete or, or a p- politician in that world would do. The, the genuine, genuine, genuine life-changing things in life command respect. Peter and John show up in this account, and they miraculously bestow the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to Acts 8, uh, 18 to 24, and let's just do 18 and 19 to start with. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so let's let's pause there. So Simon is stuck in commanding attention. He loves attention. And he says, I'll pay good money for what you guys do. Because that's better than anything I ever did. Right. <laughs> right. Man, you guys are like changing people's lives. Man, I'll pay you money. I want to be able to do that too. That's cool. He wasn't looking at it from the standpoint of what a godly, profound thing is happening. He's looking at it like, wow, people are really going to love me now. Wait, wait till I show them this trick. That's the way he was seeing it. The Apostle Peter saw right through that. And, and Peter minces no words when he talks to Simon about this. Let's continue. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray that the Lord, that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gull of bitterness and the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. So you notice that when Peter talked to him, it was all about Simon's heart. He said to him, Your heart is not right before God. And he said, Pray to the Lord that if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. And what this is telling us is managing the contents of our hearts may often mean having to clear out what has taken root in exchange for what that which is of higher value. Simon, and Rick, that happens all the time. When we, we yeah. come to Christ, we have to weed out so much of the past and the wickedness that we didn't even realize was in there. So it is a process. And, but Simon, he turned his heart to say, hey, all right, you're right. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> you, you, you told me things I needed to know, and please pray, and I want to change. So, you know, we don't hear anything of him afterwards, so we don't know if he was able to change or not. But what Peter did was alert him that in his communication, it was bitter because it came from his heart and his heart was defiled. Our hearts can be the same way. We need to be really careful about managing the contents of our hearts because, Jonathan, what the heart wants, we've said this a million times, what the heart wants, the heart always tries to get. Yes. And if what we want is not exactly in line with God's will, we can make it look like it's in line with God's will because we want it so badly. We must be careful because our communication, if it's heart-based and our heart is going down that road, our communication is not building others up. First, no, it's not. First Corinthians twelve twenty four and 25. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to the member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And is that another one another thing here? It is, Rick. Have the same care for one another. So, you know, we've, we last one was build one another up. 
have the same care for one another. And I, and I love the context of this one because it's talking about the differences within Christianity and the fact that our talents and our abilities are completely different from one another. And, and that's okay. And that's actually good. And, and what the apostle is saying is, as a matter of fact, those with fewer outward talents are the ones that end up being the most valuable because they're the glue that holds it all together. And it's just such a beautiful picture of the care for one another. So if within the body our heart is correctly tuned, we can be building up and caring for one another because the end result is the building up of the body of Christ. So I won't forget this time. Connect, right. Connecting our communication, what's our final point for this segment? Because the leaning and instruction of our hearts are instinctive, we need to manage them with care, spiritual input, and discipline. So, you know, it's not a simple matter, the, the, the dealing with our own hearts, because our hearts can, above all, be deceitful. We need to just understand that. And when we say, well, I'm speaking from my heart, I would really consider saying, hmm, what does that actually mean in this particular circumstance? It may be good but it may be deceiving even me. We just need to be careful. Have our hearts tuned to godliness, and that is how we can put this all into a much better, much more clear order in terms of our, our overall lives. So the heart, manage the contents of your heart. Now, I have to ask myself the question, is speaking from my heart a really good thing or not? What is the communication connection with how we think? Should our minds override? If we asked hearts? Rick, Jonathan, and the CQ contribution team to answer our topical questions in five minutes or less, rather than in several chapters over 90 minutes, they'd probably get a little stressed out. Plus, they love painting that bigger picture by looking at several real-world media perspectives, historical facts, and scripture. That's why some answers may come quickly. But we love taking a look at the bigger questions that aren't so easy. Even though listening is the foundation and our words are the building of strong communication, what goes into the quality of those things is paramount. As a Christian, we have our earthly minds and the mind of Christ, so we need to be especially aware of which one we are listening to. And Jonathan, this ends up having to be a conscious choice that we make. Am I listening to the mind of Christ or am I listening to the mind of Rick? And especially if the mind of Rick is, 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 is on caffeine, uh, it just is not a pleasant place to be. <laughs> yeah, I am so thankful <laughs> you're not drinking caffeine ever. <laughs> but, you know, the, the point is really, really simple and straightforward. This, we've talked about listening, respectful listening. We've talked about um, really being careful with our words and thinking before we speak. We've talked about monitoring our hearts the you know uh, or managing the, the 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 contents of our hearts and now we come down to communicating with conviction measure your purpose against christ like standards and rick to me this segment comes down to what would jesus think the wisdom of jesus you know and 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 that's such a, a good thing to think about because we always say you know well what would jesus do you know the wwjd you know, that a lot of times yeah. people have that on the little bracelet they wear. You know, what would Jesus do? Well, you know, think about what would Jesus think in such matters? Because that gets into the mind of Christ, and then the instinct ought to be, as best as possible, ooh, I want to think like that. And that's where Stephen Covey's uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, habit number four, actually comes in. What is it? Think win-win. See, and... Jesus' mind is always a win-win, because Christianity is all about salvation for all. Thinking win-win should come easily, as long as we're using the mind of Christ in our communications and not our own devices and our own thoughts and our own processes and our own, here's one, our own preconceived ideas that we would Ooh. like the scriptures to fit into. Ooh. <laughs> That's big. <laughs> yeah, and we all have we all have those, don't we? We do. We do. Okay, going on to a soundbite. This is a different source. This is um, 
how to reduce conflict and better and build better relationships uh, from Capstone Publishing. And the gentleman speaking is talking about we're dropping in in the middle of a conversation here. He's talking about a beach ball. OK, and the, the, the scene before this net, the line we're going to listen to, he's holding a beach ball in front of the camera saying, what color is this beach ball? And you see the beach ball has got you see three colors. You see, let's say, red, yellow and blue. And you say, well, the beach ball is red, yellow and blue. And he says, no, it's not. It's purple, green and orange. And you say, no, it's red, yellow, and blue. I'm looking at it. He says, no, it's purple, green, and orange. I'm looking at it because he's looking at the other side. So it's possible to see the same thing through different eyes. This has a lot to do with communication. So when he mentions the beach ball, that's what he's talking about. Am I listening to understand or listening to defend? You see, you want to tell me your side of the beach ball, but if I'm not careful, I'm interrupting you and going, ah, yes, but, ah, yes, but, ah, yes, but. You see, I've learned this with my wife, who's also my business partner. There are occasions when she needs to sit me down and give me a little bit of feedback. And if I'm not careful, I'm listening to her whilst building up the case for the defence. Do you know what I sometimes need to literally do? I need to shut up and listen. Why not develop what I call the gift of the gap? Yeah, that's right. Not the gift of the gab, the gift of the gap. Actually press pause, allow some time and space for the other person to talk and you listen. Listen to understand doesn't mean you're going to listen to agree. But once I understand your side of the beach ball and where you're coming from, perhaps you'll be more open to listening to my side of the beach ball as well. It's profound. And, you know, the, the interesting thing about all of the sound bites, while we've talked about all the different aspects of communication, every one of those sound bites has been about listening. It really has, Rick. You're right. And, you know, the reason we put it together that way is because listening is the foundation. It really is the foundation for being able to actually communicate well. So just take that to heart and listen first and then be really careful with your words. Second Corinthians 10 verses 4 to 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. So what you said before, Jonathan, this segment comes down to what does Jesus, what would Jesus, how, how did you say it? What would Jesus think? Right. The what, wisdom of Jesus, yes. Okay, what would Jesus think? We are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Our thoughts need to be captive to his way of thinking. Yes. Even if I don't like it. Yes. Even if it's, contrary to what I would like to have happen. That's yes. where we need to go. With this approach, our communication with others on every level will end up being positive. Now, that sounds so easy, but it is so hard to do. Let's just face the fact, shall we? It's easy to say, well, I'm going to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Yeah, good luck with that. It takes work. <laughs> it does. And we're Devotion, gonna... dedication. And you know what else it takes? Forgiveness. Because oh, when we yes. fail, we ask forgiveness, and we get up and try again. And then we fail, and then we get up and ask forgiveness and try again. And you know what happens then? We fail again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but the point is to keep getting up. Because if we want our communication to actually be building others up, our mind has to be focused on the right things. And not just on the right things, Jonathan. It has to be focused on the right things in the right way way. Otherwise, we can stray too easily. Great quote here from JFK. If we are strong, our strength will speak for itself. If we are weak, words will be of no help. <laughs> so, you know, words end up being powerful, but not nearly as powerful as what is driving those words if they are out of true godly power and conviction and we just got to realize that that's where this all comes down to is getting the source for our communication clear so that it helps others and so you notice jonathan what we're saying through this entire podcast is to communicate how i feel about a circumstance may have its space in in, in, a, in a conversation but it's got a very limited space 
Mm. And it's got to be put aside, should be expressed, probably if you're having a problem with another individual, to express that is entirely appropriate. But it should not be dwelt upon because we need to help everyone, ourselves included, step up. Romans twelve fourteen to 17. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. You know, of all of those lines in, in those verses, the one that really jumps out at me at this moment is do not be wise in your own estimation. Mm. It's great to try to follow righteousness and godliness and great to think, okay, I'm following that track. But, you know, let the estimation of our wisdom come from God, not from ourselves. Amen. You know, let's put the, let's try to take the ego out of all of this as much as possible. And it comes back to the point that you'd made uh, a few segments ago about humility being kind of front and center in this whole thing. Yes, yes. Well, you know, let's look at humility in a slightly different way. Let's look at humility in relation to strength. Because just because you're humble doesn't mean you can't be strong. Okay? So humility in relation to strength. Humility is not a lack of strength, nor is it a compromised approach. Humility is strength that is focused enough so as not to need ego. Let's pause there. Humility is strength that is focused enough so it's not to need ego. It doesn't need to be stroked on the back and say, wow, good job. It just needs to be presenting the strength of godliness. Humility is strength that is clear enough to not need to be seen as better than the other guy. And Rick, that made me think of the scribes and Pharisees, uh, always arguing and fighting with Jesus, um, or they were above the 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 Jewish nation and everyone else. And that was a sad situation. And Jesus tried to teach them all different ways for three and a half years to try to have them get it, and they just wouldn't listen. They wouldn't listen. They didn't want to listen, so they couldn't hear. And so the communication broke down, and Jesus could hear them. And that's the thing. He could read their hearts. He could hear them. Go ahead. And Rick, that word humility, we were talking before the podcast, and you were sharing... Humility is strength that has godliness just dripping off of it. That's right. It is, because if the godliness is there and the humble attitude is what's carrying it, that can only bring something good. Now, you may not succeed in what you're trying to accomplish, but God does take the will for the deed. Let, let's finish up five ways to listen better from Julian uh, Treasure. Uh, way number five, he's going to use an acronym in this in terms of being a better listener. And finally, an acronym. You can use this in listening in communication. If you're in any one of those roles, and I think that probably is everybody who's listening to this talk, the acronym is RASA, which is the Sanskrit word for juice or essence. And RASA stands for receive, which means pay attention to the person, appreciate, making little noises like, hmm, oh, okay. Summarize, the word so is very important in communication and ask, ask questions afterwards. But I believe that every human being needs to listen consciously in order to live fully, connected in space and in time to the physical world around us, connected in understanding to each other, not to mention spiritually connected, because every spiritual path I know of has listening and contemplation at its heart. So, you know, Jonathan, if... if, if folks would take the, the principles that we've talked about today, apply them to their family relationships between husband and wife, between parents and children, uh, within their, their church organizations, when, they, when you go to work, life will be better when you mm -hmm. learn to be the best listener that you can be. The following scriptures show strength in humility, which inevitably brings better communication. James 3, uh, 13 to 15. Who among you is wise and understanding? Let him show by his good behavior his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not be arrogant and so to lie against the truth. This wisdom is not that which comes from above, but is earthly, natural, demonic. So 
you want to be wise and understanding? And the answer should be for all of us. Yes, yes, I do, I do, I do. Okay, show that by your good behavior, by good deeds. And then the next phrase, Jonathan, I just is, is one of the most powerful that we've talked about. The gentleness of wisdom. Wisdom doesn't beat people over the head. It walks them to a conclusion. Wisdom does not need theatrics. It simply needs a hearing ear. Go ahead. And wisdom is full of righteousness, godliness, and appropriateness, and it's all working together. And uh, as well as being appropriate to the timing of the words. We've heard that several times before. So our minds Mm -hmm. cannot drive our communication if our hearts have jealousy and ambition and arrogance. Heart and mind have to work together. Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. All right. Understanding what the will of the Lord is. You've got to make, you've got to redeem the time because we don't have a lot of time. We've got to be careful with our, our, our days. So our communication through body, through words, through spoken word, through action has got to be as pure as we can make it. The only way to understand God's will is to know the mind of God, which we can only do not by instinct. Nobody knows the mind of God instinctively. We know it by knowing the word of God. That's, that's, that's that. Okay. Our final scripture. So our heart and mind are undeniably connected. Communicate by keeping both your heart and your mind, keeping them both Christ like. Colossians 3, 15 to 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, your mind, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. So let, let's go back through this now. So let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. We need the peace of Christ in our hearts. That because that settles our natural deviousness that comes from a sinful heart. It's, and the next point, let the word richly dwell within you, Rick. It's right. got to be there. And where does the word dwell? It has to dwell within your mind. If you yes. don't let the... And, and look, here, here's a common mistake I think that a lot of Christians make. They, they, they listen to a sermon or they hear some things or they hear scripture and they think, okay, I'm going to let the, you know, the word of God come into my heart and everything's going to be fine. No, it's not. Because unless you study, unless you absorb, unless you are diligent to make it a part of your thinking, it will not stay in your heart. So that's why the scripture puts both of those things together so fully. Connecting our communication, and our last point, Jonathan, is what? Our purpose in Christ cannot be clearly communicated to anyone unless we are continually rehearsing God's word and Jesus' way in both our hearts and minds. So, you know, as, as, as we, we begin to, 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 to put this all together here, communication, again, we started out by saying humanity would not exist without communication. We just wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to make it. The idea is to learn how to communicate by first listening. Because someone's got to be the one to listen. So why not be me? Listen intentionally with respect and then speak with respect and get your heart engaged into what, what you're looking at, what you're doing, and then put your mind, make it full of the word of God and the, and the mind of God so that all of these things can come into play. Communication, true, godly communication can change the way your every day goes. It can completely alter every part of your life. It can change your relationships. It can change your perceptions. It can change your effectiveness. All we need to do is go to work on ourselves. Start with listening. Monitor your words. Look at your heart and get your mind focused on the mind of Christ. For Jonathan and Rick and Christian Questions, we hope you've enjoyed being with us as we have attempted to communicate to you what we have learned 
about communicating in Christ. It can be done. Think about it. Folks, listen, we really do want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode and other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big, big part of spreading the word about our program is subscribing to Christian Questions in iTunes or Google Play or Stitcher or whatever your favorite podcast channel is. Please rate us and review us. We'd greatly appreciate it. And coming up next week, we'll be talking about, okay, you're a Christian, but are you holy? Talk to you next week.